folks, welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight. And thank you for joining us. And very excited this evening to have a very special guest. It's one of our distributed clients, the San Diego Association of Geologists. Uh, they are a publisher here in San Diego, and they have many, many books that you'll find in our catalog. And as a uh, special tonight or, or through the, this event, check out our uh, catalog on our website and you will find the, all of the SDAG books that are being discounted at 20%. So if you're interested in geology, please take a look. Now, the San Diego Association of Geologists, they are a nonprofit group of people who are interested in geology and geology professionals. So if you are interested in this topic, you know, anybody can join, you know, look up on their website to find out. They even have a special program coming up uh, tomorrow night if you care to join them. So Sunbelt has both authors that we publish their books and distributed clients. And the San Diego Association of Geologists are uh, one of our very uh, good uh, distributed clients, which we're very proud to have and sponsor here uh, tonight. Now, tonight we are having uh, Luke Weidman. Luke Weidman happens to be the president of the San Diego Association of Geologists, and he is the editor of our featured book today. And the talk that he will be doing is on the geology and enology of the Temecula Valley. And this is the second edition of this book. And the first edition was done over 20 years ago. It's been updated, new road logs in it. If you're interested in the geology and enology wine of the Temecula country, this book is definitely for you. Um, I also want to mention that there is another book that's just coming out right now that uh, will be available here in another week, and it's the Mojave Desert Unfolded, and this is one of their other publications. So please, please do check our website to find out about it. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Luke Weidman, who again is president of the San Diego Association of Geologists. And he is a geologist staff person with GeoCon, a, prof a professional engineering group. And I'm very excited to hear this talk because I was lucky enough to go on the field trip. <laughs> and all of the SGA G books are part of their annual field trip. So this was the fall field trip uh, 2020. So Luke, take it away. Hey, thanks, Diane. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so thank you, Diana. That's a very uh, warm welcome. I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight to talk to you a little bit about the uh, trip and uh, the trip we took in October of last year and the field book uh, that we worked really hard uh, on to be a sort of guidebook uh, for the trip. So without further ado, all right, here we go. Uh, so the title of the book and of our talk tonight is The Geology and Enology of the Temecula Valley. Um, this valley is located in Riverside County, and the editor of the volume is myself. I'm very, uh, very proud uh, of the work we did with this volume. Here's a, an up-close version of the cover. If you at all remember uh, the first edition, you'll recognize the front cover of the volume. It's the same. Um, we like it because it stands out, it's easy to see uh, on a shelf uh, as people sort of thumb through uh, what's available. Beautiful cover, uh, we're super happy with it. Ooh, and now as we enter the book, just a little bit about our group. Uh, we were founded in 1973, which makes our group about 50 years old. Like Diane said, we're made up mostly of professionals and research uh, geologists, but uh, we're happy to include students and general enthusiasts uh, in our community. Uh, anybody who really likes uh, geology and going on field trips is uh, more than welcome um, with us. So uh, we do like to provide that community. Uh, within the community, we, we uh, of course, bring up job opportunities, network with each other, and provide sort of uh, hopefully engaging geology talks every month. So you'll see our website there. If uh, you're interested, please uh, come to the meeting tomorrow night. We have a uh, talk from a landslide geologist with the California Geological Survey. Um, our meeting is about the same time tomorrow night, 6.30. Uh, if you'd like the link, just uh, go to the website there and um, 
send us an email or click the contact button. We'll be able to get back to you, no problem. Uh, so with, uh, with the group every year, we do a field trip. Um, just to list a few of the places we've been in the past. In 2017, we went down to Baja, Mexico. That was fantastic. We took a bus down there um, across the border to and fro. In 2018, we went up to Rainbow Basin, the Calico area. And then uh, last year, we were lucky, able, lucky enough to get up to the Owens Valley, which is probably the furthest we've been from our home base in San Diego. And then of course, 2020, the year of COVID was a return to the Temecula Valley. Uh, the person who was in charge of the first trip uh, was named Barbara Birnbaum. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and we still in this edition include a lot of her work. She did uh, such a great job. Um, so the production of this guidebook is actually a lot of work. And with that, I want to thank these two gentlemen. They did a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes uh, to putting the volume together, to putting the trip together. Um, I was vice president of the group last year, so it was my responsibility to make sure the trip went well, happened, <laughs> which thankfully it did. And, uh, but you know, a lot of the hard work um, belongs to these gentlemen. So I wanna make sure that uh, they get their just rewards, credit where credit's due, right? Uh, so a little bit more on the cover. I already talked about how the front cover sticks out. You can see how the yellow of the mountains contrasts very well with the, the blues of the valley there. Now that's a, it's showing much more than just the relief of the valley because the valley is sort of enclosed on three sides by mountains. And the mountains on the bottom left of the cover there are the ones actually blocking the cool coastal winds from entering the valley. Um, you know, which raises naturally the temperature of the valley, dries out the soil, and it's not very good growing environment for grapes. Uh, but if you look on the right-hand side, the image from the back of the book actually shows uh, the two gaps in the southern portion of the valley that allow cool air to sort of come in, bring that coastal moisture to the valley, um, cool things down and allow grapes to grow, have a habitat where they're happy. Um, you'll see sort of the 15 freeway runs through there. That's the rainbow gap. Um, and then if you sort of see on the right-hand side, there's a, a little gorge there, a sinuous gorge. That's the Santa Margarita River. So both of those gaps in the mountains there allow for the, the climate to uh, be of grape growing capacity. Uh, so here's a brief look at the table of contents. Um, I put this up here just to show you guys what kind of goes into a guidebook. Um, the first part of it is the road logs, and that's basically a step-by-step -step guide of the field trip that the group takes. Um, and then we go into a little bit of the background information on geology and the enology. By the way, I don't know if I've said up to this point, but enology is the study of wine, right? So geology is the study of rocks. We all know this, but enology, in case you are wondering, is the study of wine, wine making in particular. So anyway, in th those sections, we like to provide sort of the, the, uh, the more in-depth information on uh, the region, um, the geology of the region, right? And uh, of course, a little bit on the history. So we'll get into everything in this way here. So we start with the road logs. Here's the map we provide. Uh, in the first edition, there were three routes. Uh, we eliminated one of the routes from uh, this edition because it didn't uh, really stick with a, um, a COVID, <laughs> COVID safe field trip. Um, but we did keep one of the routes and that's the route in light blue um, that basically goes around the uh, Santa Rosa plateau there. And um, we did add to this uh, this route two side trips and those are highlighted in the, in the green there. Um, and then of course the route that we that's brand new to the edition is uh, a route of the region's mines. Uh, so that's highlighted in dark blue and starts with uh, the gold mines of Alice, the Alice mine and the Lucky Boy mine before heading up to north of Lake Elsinore there into the Albert Hill clays where the uh, Pacific Clay Mining Company is busy removing clay from the ground there to turn into various uh, products. 
Uh, so a little bit of what the road logs look like as you flip through the book. Each road log here has sort of an introduction uh, with the people responsible for the road log, um, summary information, and uh, a sort of a brief description about what you're going to see and the route uh, that the road takes. Um, most of it looks like this, where you have mileage, uh, stop descriptions, and any hazards that might be along the way. If the road all of a sudden wants to take a steep grade or uh, it changes from asphalt to gravel, right? These are all uh, important things we want to include on the road log so that everybody can have uh, a nice safe trip, uh, you know, in our footsteps. We do also provide some pictures uh, for visual aid to sort of show exactly what we want you to look at. And uh, in this edition, we're happy to include a number of these breakouts that are new. Uh, this one uh, in the example is written by our own Nori Robbins about sort of uh, the indigenous peoples of the Santa Margarita River. Really cool uh, little tidbits that go along with the road logs um, to sort of enhance your experience as you drive. So here's, um, you know, so I guess a, you'd, you'd also call these table of contents. So here's where my, my knowledge of uh, publications uh, is still lacking. I'm sure there's a, a term for this type of page that's a table of contents in the middle of the book, but I don't know it. <laughs> so I'll call it a mid-book table of contents. This one's specifically for the wine and the history. Um, from the first edition, we carried over four of the papers that basically go over the who, what, when, where, and why of wine in the valley. Um, we added some papers on the general history of settlement in the region um, and a new paper on uh, the gold mines of the region. Um, the gold mines were sort of a push of Luther Wilson. Luther Wilson's middle name is actually Menifee. So the town's named after him, um, even though his name's Luther Wilson. So this is Barbara Birnbaum's um, paper on wine making. Uh, we left it in because it's uh, just fantastic uh, to give the reader a base knowledge on, you know, the history of winemaking um, and how people from the start of the Valley's wine industry went about their decision making. You know, how did they choose the vineyards? When they looked at soils, what kind of moisture were they looking for? You know, uh, they had to have find an area where the soil uh, was, wasn't hard pack to a depth that would allow the grape roots to grow, right? They're looking for specific mineral balances and pHs of the soil. Not only that, but the pros and cons that come along with being in such a, a strange valley. Um, she also touches a little bit on the, the hazards to winemaking, right? So any diseases the grapes could, uh, the grape plants could catch <laughs> or bugs in the reason that like to eat your, your grape vines. Um, and then a little bit on how wine is made. Really cool paper. Uh, a little bit more on the history of Temecula wine. This is specifically from the Wine Growers Association in Temecula Valley. Um, and this one is much more of a sort of timeline of the wine, of the history of the wine industry in the region. Another kind of cool little fun uh, paper to fill in the base knowledge of, of the reader. Uh, this is the paper by Kerry Cato on the historical settlement in the area. He goes back all the way to 1797, I think, um, when the Spanish came over and had their first interactions with the indigenous, indigenous peoples. You can see that sort of color map there. I wanted to make sure I include that in case you were curious of which indigenous peoples lived in the area. You can see the Gabrieleño, the Cajuya. Um, I'm not, oh my goodness, Luceño. Anyway, I'm probably butchering those. Uh, so he talks in this paper a lot about uh, the settlers' interactions with the indigenous people um, and settlement in the valley all the way through the addition of the railroad and um, into the present. He also includes these really old timey photos. I love these um, in papers. You know, it really helps seal sort of the visual image that I have in my head when you read. Um, and here we finally get to Bob Kent's paper on Luther Menifee, who was a wild individual and uh, his gold mines in the area. So uh, Mr. Kent included this nice little map for the readers to, you know, overlaid on a, uh, on what looks to be a Google Earth image here. So you can even find where these mines 
uh, from the 1800s are in in real life next to those next to those roads. You can almost GPS them. In fact, that's what we did to find a lot of these. <laughs> Luckily, when we were out there looking for even the Lucky Boy mine, we had some local help uh, to lead us right exactly to where the pit in the ground was. Um, and then we get into the geology. Here's another sort of mid book table of contents. Uh, but this one's about the geology. Again, we kept four returning papers from the first edition. Um, and these are basically the papers on uh, the geology, geostructure, uh, faulting in the area and landslides, along with any uh, other hazards, specifically subsidence or, or liquefaction. Um, we did add a paper on the mining of the wine cave tunnel. <laughs> I don't know if that's redundant or not, uh, but the tunnel for the wine cave over at Oak Mountain Winery. Um, a really interesting read full of uh, full color, beautiful photos uh, from that sort of mining adventure. Uh, we'll get in, I'll show you, show you that paper and photos from it here pretty soon. Uh, we have two new papers on the regional clays and what could possibly be learned from those clays in the area, including, including the fact that they might be evident of uh, the impact crater that killed the dinosaurs back at the KT boundary. So we provide these research papers uh, to give the reader, you know, like I said, just a really healthy background knowledge of what they're looking at when they drive around. Uh, so here are the highlights of the geology papers uh, on geology and structure from Kerry Cato, and then uh, ground fissures in subsidence zones uh, by Roy Schliemann. So you can see Kerry's paper, he talks a lot about the history of the geology, the major geologic processes that influence the area, uh, the major lithologies, you know, so this is just the major types of rock, major, major units in the area, and the geomorphology, so sort of the basic, uh, the more modern land landforms and reasons for those landforms in the area. And then the Schliemann photos, actually full of really old, cool photos of these uh, fissures that would um, pop up through the asphalt and uh, specifically like the Temecula fissures and the Murrieta fissures, right? Bland names for the region. <laughs> um, and the subsidence zones, which have much more cool names like Silverhawk zone. I don't know why they didn't call them the Silverhawk fissures. That sounds cooler. So you can see the geology papers loaded with lots of really fun, colorful photos to catch the eye of the reader, hopefully engage them, make them want to be uh, more knowledgeable about the geology in the area. Certainly when I see a color photo like the one in the top left there, that geology map, I immediately start to look around. What that geology map highlights is uh, the contrast in the rock types on either side of the Elsinore fault zone there. Um, you can see the different colors represent uh, different rocks it actually comes with a legend that has the image below it. So you can match for yourself which rock is to which color. What's cool is you can see how much work that fault zone's already done in terms of placing rocks of different type right next to each other. You can see the cross section here in the Elsinore fault zone. Again, just have these really, really cool contrast in the rocks. And it's visible when you're out there in the valley. And when you're on one side and you look across to the other, the rocks just, uh, they stick out, they, they're not the same. Um, and then the photo on the bottom there are, are the two gaps that I've already talked about sort of briefly. Um, I don't know if I named them, the Rainbow Gap and the Santa Margarita River Gap. Those are the gaps, the two giant holes in the mountains there that allow the cold, wet air to come into the valley. Here's some photos from the fissure, fissure paper by Roy Schliemann. Um, now they're black and white, but obviously the photos aren't too old. <laughs> uh, but the cross section is really cool. You can sort of see in detail um, how the fault sort of is expressed uh, through asphalt. And then of course, a, uh, a uh, dry, well, I shouldn't say dry, a settlement zone here. I think this is actually, yeah, yeah, golf course. This is the old golf course. You can see the guy golfing right there golfing in a giant uh, subsidence zone. 91 is when that photo was taken. Uh, so then we get into the hazards papers. Um, 
the Oak Mountain landslide, landslide complex paper is really interesting um, by our own Mike Hart and Monty Murbach. Uh, they talk about the structure and mechanisms of failures in the lands, uh, of the landslides in the area. And then uh, we provided a, a paper by um, Leighton and Perez and Bausch, all with different groups, uh, but they got together to produce uh, a paper that has a lot of the hazard maps of the region, which is sort of cool to flip through, um, especially when you're uh, at the end of our route up at the viewpoints to kind of look out at the valley with uh, some of these hazard maps. It gives you a pretty cool, pretty cool indication of how it was uh, developed. Uh, so anyway, here's some images from those papers. This is the Oak Mountain line slide complex here. Um, they tried to overlay it, I imagine, on this photo, but found it tough. Anyway, that's what this this white dash line is here. This represents the the landslide in the middle of the mountains there. And then these are what some of the hazard maps look like. This is a landslide hazard map. This is a uh, liquefaction hazard map. Um, and they are colored to represent sort of different uh, amounts of susceptibility to either landslides or liquefaction. Obviously, uh, let's see, the darker colors are usually higher. Yeah, red, red high to green very low. So in terms of liquefaction, it's worst here in the center of these valleys where all of the sediment has gathered. And that sort of is like a giant bathtub when things start shaking. So this is might actually be my favorite paper in uh, in the book, and it's just not just because I work in geotech, but this is uh, the paper provided by Kerry Cato about their experience mining the Oak Mountain Wine Cave. You can see in the photo there the sort of initial plans, the tunnels they wanted to uh, mine, and how they were going to connect. Um, so he talks a lot about the local geologic setting, meaning the geology of this hill. <laughs> and uh, what sort of were the engineering and construction considerations that went into uh, constructing the tunnel? You know, you, you have to decide, is it really worth mining a tunnel, mining a wine cave in here uh, when we could sort of just remove the mountainside and build the wine cave? Uh, that's in fact what we're doing for the Europa uh, winery in the area. They decided to just mine the mountain away or I should say grade the mountain away and um, build the wine cave and then bury the wine cave. But for this one, they decided to um, mine it and it came you know, with uh, those with many pros and cons. Here's some of the photos from that adventure. Um, you can see sort of the lengths they had to go to. Here you can see this wire mesh to make sure that the, you know, there were no cave-ins um, as they mined. So they would mine a little bit at a time and then sort of uh, reinforce that area before moving on and mining a little bit more. So it was very much, you know, increment by increment process. Um, and even as careful as they were, they still had uh, two cave-in events, one which was pretty major and buried a guy in his machine up to about his waist, I think. So um, that's pretty wild. To hear him talk about it was uh, a lot of fun. Here's what it looks like in cross-section in case you're curious. So we move on to the papers about clay. These are really interesting just because of what uh, uh, Bush and Miller here uh, seem to posit. So they basically uh, provide um, here a clay strat section and um, what they did was compare the stratigraphy sections of the local clays here uh, to other impact, meteorite impact sites and what the lithology and strateg stratigraphy looked like at those sites. Um, so here's some photos. I thought these would be cool. So on the uh, left here, these are sort of impact lapilli uh, in the clays. And then here we even have uh, sort of a clay matrix, yeah, kaolinite matrix um, impact fallout. So they contrast, they compare contrast uh, 
local sites. And this one is from, uh, oh boy, I want to say North, Northern California. Um, and then this one, here's the local, I'm sorry, this is, these are the local, and this one is from uh, France, an impact site in France. And you can sort of see how similar they are to the fine clay matrix with these really sort of brecciated class uh, within the matrix. And then the image on the right, are those clays sort of uh, in outcrop? Um, there it is, there's a little branch for scale there. <laughs> really cool paper. Um, and glassed but not gleased, the glossary. A little fun with words there. I really wish everybody was unmiked. I'm sure you're howling with laughter at my well thought out PowerPoint joke. Uh, anyway, these are all, these are in uh, most books. And this is just to make sure everybody sort of has, a, you know, a, a baseline definitions for things. We can all be on the same page when we're talking. They know exactly what we're trying to get across. <laughs> and then at the end of the appendices, this might be the most, the most cool in the entire volume, and that is the map of wineries. So we provided sort of a real general map of the area, uh, at least where most of the wineries are, uh, are found. This is updated from the first edition. Um, we're also happy to include breweries in this edition. Back when in 2000, when the trip was first run, I don't think there were any breweries in Temecula. Uh, and now there are a number, almost 20, I think. So we've included an updated list on the wines and a list of the uh, breweries. So um, we thought that would be a, a very, well, poignant addition, seeing how this is geology and enology. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy I could sort of virtually take you through this edition. I'm super happy with it. Um, and I just, again, want to pass my thanks on to Greg and Dave and uh, everybody else that put in their hard hours, hard working hours. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Luke. What a great presentation. I do want to mention that at the end of the book, there's an appendix, a table back there. Not only do you have the map of all of the breweries and the wineries, but there's a total listing of every single winery and brewery their websites, their information on their address, the phone numbers, do they have tours, do they have food? So this is a great guidebook if you just want to even just kind of check out the wineries and check out the breweries. You know, it's a handy guidebook, it's total up to date, so it's very special. So um, what I'd like to do right now is kind of see, um, Rebecca, have there been folks that uh, have questions to ask Luke? And I might start off with one just real quick. What, what's the best time of year to take this, to take the tour that we, you have in the book here? What, when do you recommend, um, what time of year should people take this tour? Uh, that's a great question, Diane. Of course, Southern California, Southern California here, uh, there's not really a terrible time, but of course, if you want the crispest weather conditions and you want um, sort of a clear view of the valley, um, then I would come early summer when the winds aren't whipping too bad yet, but they're still up high enough to sort of clear the sky of the haze. You can see the entire valley, plus um, things are cool enough to for you to really hike around and explore the different um, uh, off-route hikes if you want to be able to do that. Um, we offer in this book, a in one of the side trips, uh, a hike down the Santa Margarita River Gorge, and that hike can be as uh, short or as long as you like it. It's huge. Um, so in terms of time of year, yeah, early summer, early summer, that's usually when the, um, a lot of the, uh, I shouldn't say jazz, but jazz and um, movie festivals are, are popping off. But if what you're looking for is maybe the, uh, the hot air balloon festival, then that's later summer. Is that the same time that the, that they tell you to come sample the wines? Is there a time of year that's best to sample wines? To sample wines? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, year round, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> right. So uh, Rebecca, do we have some questions from some of the viewers? 
There's a question from John. Could you talk about the grapes and the wines of the area versus Central California or the Northern California wine country? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, it just won't be with much uh, information. I'm not, uh, I'm much more interested in the breweries myself. So in terms of uh, <laughs> the, the pros and cons of Temecula's wines versus Central California or Northern California, I'm not sure. Um, I know that we use a lot of uh, similar grapes as Central California, uh, but in terms of how they use those grapes to make what type of wine, I lose interest pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, thankfully, I enjoy drinking it. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be more helpful in answering that question. Luke, what makes the soil so good for the wine? Why, why is Temecula a wine area? Well, it's a mixture of things. It's a, a valley is, well, we get sediment from a number of different source, sources in the region. And so um, in order to, in order for grapes to grow, it is my understanding, they're very finicky about pH and such. Um, so because, uh, because the valley is, uh, I don't know, so diverse in its source material, uh, I think that's the reason why. Usually it's, uh, at least that's the reason in central California, I might be talking from my rear end right now, uh, but I think it's just the diversity of source material. It makes this defining of soil that's pH uh, neutral and mineral rich pretty easy. Some more questions. Uh, how do we buy your book? Well, you can <laughs> buy the book uh, at, through Sunbelt Publications. Stop at our warehouse, check our website. It's available. It'll be available at uh, all your favorite bookstores, online bookstores, or your physical. You can go into Barnes and Noble, Amazon, um, gift shops in Temecula. So it will be found everywhere once you know we get out. It's arriving next week. Uh, so you can put your orders in and they can be shipped to you. And if you want to buy on our website, of course, you get the discount. So we've got one, another person says, I've lived 15 minutes from Temecula for 30 years and never knew about its geology. I'm excited to get a better understanding and look forward to reading your book. Hey, Very that, good. Excellent. That excellent. excites me. Yeah. See, do you have some more? Um, did you see Rebecca? I don't see any more, but I had a question. I'm trying to figure out how to word it. What, what is a hazard, a geologic hazard? Like, can you explain what that means in geology to a geologist? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. It's, uh, well, a hazard is, is something that provides, uh, well, a potential danger to uh, people or uh, infrastructure. And uh, so a geologic hazard is basically uh, a danger provided by uh, or produced by the, the geology of the area. So in this case, um, there's a pretty major fault zone running through the area. So obviously faulting uh, would be uh, a geological hazard that we're concerned about and want to map. Um, and from faulting, uh, you can go, you go all over the place. Uh, you know, seismic shaking in the region itself is a geologic hazard. And when things shake seismically like this, you get liquefaction uh, where the sand beneath you will stop acting like a solid and start acting like a liquid and move and flow and swallow up anything that sort of rests atop it. So that's a geologic hazard. Um, landslides, you know, again, caused by shaking seismicity from the local faults can cause uh, literally the sides of mountains to, <laughs> to fall loose and tumble down uh, into the valley. So these are all things that we want to be aware of uh, and meticulously map and uh, update so that uh, the areas, you know, the city planners of the, uh, everybody that needs to be in the know, can know where these dangers are um, so that we don't, we build smartly, we develop smartly. 
Yeah, we don't want to build a skyscraper right atop something that's going to move and shake uh, in the near future. Luke, do you happen to know, are there particular grapes that grow better in Temecula than in other areas? Is there like a, a favorite kind of grape that does better there? Uh, I don't know. I want to say yes. I want to say yes. Again, I'm not, I wish I was more savvy on like the types of grapes they used here, but I just, I just, do they grow hops in the area for the beer? <laughs> no, unfortunately, the hops are imported. Oh, okay. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> All right. Well, we have another, there's another question. How old is the valley? Are there dinosaur bones there? Oh, boy. Um, I don't think there are dinosaur bones. Um, I don't think there are dinosaur bones. I think there are camel bones and uh, bison bones. Uh, horse bones, but I don't think there are any dinosaur bones. Um, in terms of the age of the valley, well, if we flip over to the geologic map, right, in here in this little description section uh, provides, you know, the, the, the type, the rock type that's shown in these maps. And, and we have rocks as old as uh, the Cretaceous uh, in the valley. And those are mostly found in the uh, Santa Margarita River Gorge area. One comment came in said um, from Diane Murbach, to make it the grapes like heat, such as Italian grapes. Huh. And Monty Murbach says he can add some comments on the grapes. Monty, sir. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Yes, all right. So uh, Diane Murbach just alluded, alluded to that. So yes. Um, the, the the valley likes the heat, so the grapes grapes uh, when they first started, they were experimenting. Um, we were there when they were like trying mm -hmm. Chardonnay and other uh, other grape varieties that did did not do well. And so the, the recently, the last more recent batches, the, the Italian grapes, the, the the vines they could they could handle the heat. And the really great thing about the Temecula area is, uh, Luke mentioned it earlier, are uh, the, the Gap Valley, so Rainbow Gap and, and uh, Santa Margarita, Margarita River. That gap that brings the cool air during the night and that saves that valley. So uh, lots of heat during the day, gets those Italian style of grapes cooking, <laughs> which they love to cook. But then uh, thank heavens for the evening, uh, brings in cool air from the coast through those gaps. Just go, if you're up there in that area in the, in the summertime, just go 10 miles to the north. It's 10 degrees instantly hotter up there. It's just amazing the difference. And, and so it's, uh, the Temecula Valley is just, uh, they're very lucky to be in their, in that region <laughs> with their particular, uh, also the soil type, but, but to have that kind of, uh, climate control you will from the valley and it's, and it's fantastic so they've now pretty much everyone has ripped out all the other sensitive grapes if you pinot noir will not grow in that area chardonnay will right. not grow but but uh um i know there uh there, there are some whites I, I don't know if they're doing sangiovese uh the white or their the uh, red so they're doing sangiovese diane murbach can probably pipe in but um and there's just um Maybe some Viognier for a white wine for the for the grape and a couple couple others, but um, that's what I that's my recollection. So it's it's fantastic and and the the wineries, believe me, they they love the original book. So we're all looking forward to having the new book. So thank you. That's yeah. great. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks for adding to that. Well, if if we don't have any more questions, I want to thank everybody for joining in on a, on this Sunbelt Spotlight. And I just want to kind of tell you that the next spot we're going to have is going to be on February 17th at 1 p.m. And it will be Mike Wells and Marie Simovich. And they will be talking about the Anser Borrego natural history. Uh, both Mike and Marie uh, taught this class for many, almost 14, 15 years at USD. And so it's been put into a book, everything you ever wanted to know about Anza Borrego, its natural history. So please join us on that spotlight. And just again, wanna remind you, 
uh, take advantage of the discount we have now on all of the SDAG titles. And if you're interested in geology or in, in the winery, you know, come again and uh, take a look at the uh, website for the San Diego Association of Geologists and check them out and maybe even come, uh, come on and uh, join the meeting tomorrow night. Um, excellent talk. I think you would enjoy it. Again, thank you for attending and uh, hope we see you at the next Sunbelt Spotlight. Thank you, Luke, too, for one. Yeah, thank you, guys.